Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this uh, Clear Water Streams Wet Wade Fishing Tips. Uh, we're going to be covering mostly smallmouth bass today, um, talking about our rivers on the eastern half of Oklahoma. Um, so this is my favorite course of the year. Uh, this is kind of my bread and butter, um, clear water stream fishing, North America. And Oklahoma's got some pretty uh, good fisheries here in the eastern half of the state, especially for uh, pretty decent sized smallmouth bass. Um, you're not going to get into the same real size that you will over in like Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, but um, we do have two native strains of fish here are Washita smallmouth and our Neosho strain smallmouth along with a mixture of Tennessee strain that are not native that have been stocked in reservoirs throughout the state over the years um, that end up in the river systems uh, that those reservoirs are impounded on. So uh, these courses are meant to be conversational. So at any time, please use the chat bar, ask questions. If you have comments, anything like that, we'll just address things as we go along. Um, and, uh, we're just going to jump right into it here. So smallmouth bass fishing for the most part, I mean, just wet wade, clear water fishing, you really don't need that much equipment. There's a couple of different baits I'm going to show that you could take those anywhere and you're going to have success, but we've got 44 tackle boxes that I've counted here to go through. Uh, most of this stuff is kind of irrelevant, but it will catch fish. So if you got it in your tackle box, um, it may be something that you try. So we'll get right into it. I'm going to start with top water. Um, top water is an effective way to catch fish, uh, especially early morning hours, like right around dawn. And then again, it does smallmouth bass. They kind of patrol their home pool, home run, um, and they'll push up into that shallow water in the early morning hours, late evening hours. And they're a little bit more willing to come up to the surface. But when, anytime you're fishing clear water, these fish, they like to stay lower down in the water column just to avoid avian predators and everything else. So you really only get that opportunity to hit them with top water for the most part, early morning, late evening. Um, you can get them to come up higher into the water column, like right at the surface. They might just not come up on top. So we have some things that you can throw kind of out in the film of runs where you can get some fish. But I'm going to start with top water. With top water, there's a few baits that are just going to be a little bit better than all the other ones, um, which are going to be kind of like walk the dog baits, which are just long slender profile or torpedo type baits. But you can uh, you can get them to come up on frogs, so like a hollow body frog, just something like this, just your basic kind of Kermie frog. Lots of different brands make something like this. It's a hollow body. It's got two hook points here in the back and then you can toss this up. This is great on like, you know, Blue River uh, areas where there's lots of either vegetation or overhang where you can throw a hollow body frog and not get hung up. And you can kind of work this underneath trees, throw it into a bush and let it fall down onto the water and kind of work it away. And you'll find some fish using something like this. But uh, for the most part, our smallmouth bass in the state when we're fishing rivers, they're going to be in that clear faster moving water. Um, Blue River is kind of the anomaly that's more of a very, very slow flow, lots of back pools. It warms up a lot quicker. And there's Tennessee strain that are in there that were stocked a long time ago, and they're naturally occurring in there. So some of your biggest smallmouth bass that you're going to catch in the state of Oklahoma in a river are going to come from Blue River. There's just not very many of them. Um, mostly spotted bass in that river, which are a ton of fun to catch. Most of them are going to average somewhere between six and 14 inches. So something like this, um, anytime that you're thinking about river fishing in Oklahoma, outside of Blue River, if you're just trying to target big fish in deep waterfall holes or big deep runs, um, or you're on the Illinois, and if you're on the Illinois and you're floating, uh, odds are you probably have a couple of different rod options. But for the most part, anywhere you're going to stream fish in Oklahoma, you're going to be using somewhere between like a five foot, six foot, six light action to medium light action rod. Um, most of the time, six pound fluorocarbon test is all that you need. Uh, that's a really good kind of happy median, um, really good river line to use. 
If you're in the Illinois, you're in Blue River, you might go up to eight pounds, maybe even 10 pounds, uh, just depending on the type of equipment you're using and what bait you're throwing. But six pound light action, medium light action rod, most of the baits you're going to be throwing are going to be under an eighth of an ounce. So that's all you really need. But if you're going to throw, you know, a, a hollow body top water frog or something like that, you may elect for braided line with a monofilament leader, or just straight monofilament, like eight, 10 pounds, um, just because you need more of a medium action rod to get a good hook set with most top water baits, just the way that they hit them. You really got to kind of give them a good hook set when they take it underwater. So hollow body frog, rattle frog, you can try them. But again, if you're going to be top water fishing on the clear water streams, you're really looking right at dawn, right at dusk. Other than that, there's no need to be throwing top water because you're going to catch just as many fish fishing subsurface. You're going to catch more fish fishing subsurface. But it's always fun and exciting to bring a fish up to the top, especially a smallmouth bass that's got a lot of weight back behind them, a lot of energy. So even a little small 10 inch fish is going to turn over a light action or medium light action rod. You know, it's going to turn it over pretty good. So if you're using top water, you probably elect for a medium action rod, at least eight pound monofilament or braided line, uh, both of which float. Um, Blue River, you can throw braided line. Water's dingy enough. I mean, it's clear, but it's dingy. You can get away with throwing a green braid, a white braid, anything like that. It's not going to spook the fish. If you're in the Illinois, Barren Fork, Rock Creek, one of the tributaries off of Grand Lake, something like that, where it's super crystal clear water, then you might elect for throwing maybe like six or eight pound monofilament. So you just, you know, fish can't see it as well, but usually not that big of an issue. You can throw some poppers. If you start splashing poppers, either, you know, bigger ones, kind of pencil poppers, these are like a medium, medium size popper right here, small size popper, something like this. You're going to get probably a lot of sunfish that'll come up and probably catch the treble hook, but they are an option for, uh, for top water. Really with smallmouth, the ones that you really have a lot of success on um, are going to be kind of wake baits or walking dog baits. So something like a jitterbug. Black is always a great color. Ponds, creeks, rivers, anytime you're fishing topwater. Having one solid dark colored bait and then a lighter bodied colored bait. So something that's just like a basic frog. Jitterbugs, very effective. Don't have to... Don't need a lot of effort to fish them. You just cast them straight out, slow retrieve in. That jitter on the front just does this and it just kind of wakes in and it creates kind of like a snake or a lizard or something that's kind of working its way through the water, even a bait fish up on the top. So you can draw in strikes like that. Um, another good hollow body frog option, again, just all black. So having just a basic color, a natural kind of bullfrog color, and then a black colored top water. No matter what you're using, those are always kind of your two basic color choices that you'd go with. Um, but the ones that you're really going to find a lot more success on the top with for smallmouth is getting into a little bit smaller profile. So like an inch and seven eighths, little Heaton torpedo. These are great. So they just have a little torpedo on the back right here. Just creates a wake off the back and it's very subtle, creates a very soft gurgling noise across the top again these are baits that you don't have to work very hard you just cast them out really just slow steady retrieve and it's going to create that wake and you're just waiting for that fish to come up so you don't have to work these very hard these are going to be probably your two best top water baits that you're going to have for smallmouth in clearwater creeks in oklahoma little crawdad color and then just a silver black back just a basic bait fish color but these are one and seven eighths they're really small not even the size of my finger. So really good bait profile. The big ones can swallow these, but the little ones will get hooked up. The other baits that are also effective are going to be your walking dogs. You know, walk the dog lure. These ones require a little bit more work. So these ones, when you cast them out, they're easier to fish with a bait caster so you can pick up your line. But all you're doing is just knocking your rod tip down or sideways, depending on where you're at having to fish. And all you're doing with this bait is every time you pull, it's going to turn it one way, then it's going to turn it the other way. And you're just kind of walk the dog and you just work it back in. Just pop, pick up your slack, pop, pop. It'll do this, pick up your slack. And you just do that and work it all the way in. But they require a little bit more work. So the torpedoes, you're going to get bit just as often. This is just a little bit bigger bait profile. 
but those are really your two best top water baits for smallmouth if you're going to use top water on any of the creeks to try to get after them. And then you can go with a little bit bigger profile, maybe on the Illinois River, especially farther down river, like south of the 62 Bridge, where there's some bigger fish, especially in the summer. You're going to get fish that'll come up out of the lake and kind of hang out around like Horseshoe Bend up river. A lot deeper water stays kind of cool as compared to the north end of the lake because you have that spring fed river coming in. Um, but using like an another type of wake bait, these are Berkeley Choppos, Whopper Plopper. It's Different brands are making them now, but it's basically you just have a wee little turn wheel on the back that creates a gurgling sound again. But these are going to be a little bit bigger bait profile. And again, these are super easy to fish. You cast them straight out. So if you're fishing in a river and you're fishing top water, you're going to want to work the back end of pools. So when a big bend in the river where you have that fast moving current, you kind of want to cast just to where the current's going. And then you're going to work it out of that current along those seam lines. And that's where those fish are going to be waiting. You can also cast across that current line to the far bank where you're going to get a little bit more slack water and probably more like the walking, you know, walk the dog type bait where it hits and your line's going to be getting pulled by that current. So it's going to give it a couple of quick tweaks on its own and you'll get them to come up. Baits like this, you're going to have to work a little bit quicker, but you can get an aggressive fish that's sitting up underneath a log or the bank, just where that cut comes along. But, you know, any anywhere you're fishing top water, you're just looking to cast either straight cross current or just a little bit upstream because the river's working against you just to get it going. And then you'll find kind of what your happy line is to get it in without the bait getting pushed too far down or you can't catch up to it because it's taking your line so fast and the bait's not working effectively. But there's lots of different options of these types of baits. We have kind of a bullfrog pattern. Like I said, a good black is always just a solid dark color is a good one. Um, you're going to have something that looks like a bluegill. Then just your kind of basic shad patterns. Bone, bone white. These colors are good in a river. Something like this. Just an all white kind of bone, bone, pearl white type color, um, basic shad patterns. Then again, here's a bigger, a little bit bigger torpedo. This is going to be more like a two and a seven eighths, a little bigger profile. Um, and then just a mixture of different colors of walk the dog baits. But those, those are all you're ever going to need for top water. Like I said, the walk the dog baits and the torpedoes are going to be the most effective, but any one of these baits, uh, right at dawn and then at dusk you can bring some fish up off the bottom so now we're going to move on to our hard baits uh, again this is all stuff that you can use it will catch some fish it'll catch a mixture of fish but if you are looking to just straight target smallmouth bass you can kind of avoid these baits but if you have them in your tackle box they're going to find fish so these are a good one for uh really light action rods. So if you're using like six, four, six pound test on a light action rod of any size, using a super duper, which is just a shaved piece of metal. So concave like this, it's open. And all it does, it's on a half swivel. So as you're slowly reeling it in, it's just flashing back and forth. Chartreuse, silver, gold. These come in three different sizes, a 500, a 501, and a 502. The 500s are like a 32nd ounce. The 501s are like a 132nd to 116. And a 502 is like a little bit bigger than a 116. But here's the three different sizes. So here's our 502. This is our biggest size. Or sorry, this is a 501. So this is our medium size. Here's our 502. Here's our bigger one. But they just give off a little flash in the water, just like a little unsuspecting any one of our shiners, darters, bait fish. These just do a good job of mimicking any type of small bait that's in the water. So you're going to get bit with these. Might not be as effective for smallmouth, but you're going to catch pan fish. You're going to catch white bass. Um, just any predator fish. They uh, Little small metal baits are just do a really good job of just giving off a flash and they're always going to attract some attention. 
Um, same thing goes for like rooster tails. So box of rooster tails here. If I was going to use a rooster tail, I'd be sticking with something like these olive colors, brown color, something like this. You might even go for a chartreuse. But if you have these in your box, again, these are very easy baits to fish. Um, and most of the stuff that is good for smallmouth is also pretty easy to fish. It doesn't require a lot of work. Um, but if you happen to have those inline spinners, uh, super dupers, those are going to work in any creek or river. It's just a good way to get up on fish pretty quickly. Um, but more than likely you're going to be catching a lot of pan fish, non, non target species like you would with your small mouth. Same thing goes for like your spoons and cast masters and just shaved pieces of metal. Different types of colors we got here, but all still pretty natural. We got our silvers, chartreuse tails, orange tails, but it's all some form of a gold or silver with orange, red, blue. Very basic natural colors, just gives off a flash in the water. But all of these lures are going to run in the 1 16th to 1 8th ounce. So they're really easy to just cast out and retrieve. Outside of Blue River and some parts of the Illinois, you're dealing with cobble bottom. So you're not really getting hung up on vegetation or laydowns because you can physically see the laydowns for the most part. Um, so using some metal baits, just easy cast and retrieve, slow, steady retrieve, you're going to catch fish. Um, and then here's just another mixture of some rooster tails, blacks and whites and just pretty basic, but I'm sure... You got some type of inline spinner laying around in a box. You take them to a creek, you're going to catch some fish, especially if it's in that smaller size, that 16th ounce. Um, you really don't need in any of these rivers outside of maybe the Illinois when it's a little high um, and you, you're trying to get down in maybe a tighter area where the water's really rushing and get down lower in the water column. Um, but that just doesn't really come into play a lot. Usually 16th ounce is a perfect ounce to throw out to catch fish or fish. So 15th ounce, 16th ounce, jig head, Ned head rig. Um, those are going to kind of be your size profile, but an eighth ounce, you can use that blue river, Illinois. Um, but again, you've got to burn it so fast that you're really looking for super aggressive fish. If you can slow it down with the 16th ounce, and just slow your retrieve down a little bit, you're going to get bit more often. You're going to pick up more fish. Um, so that's kind of the deal with river fishing. You can burn eighth ounce uh, baits all day long, um, but you're only going to get a few active, aggressive fish to go after. It's always easier to just kind of bounce them around. So another type of top water that we have is a buzz bait. So something like this. It's got Kind of looks like a spinner bait. This is up on the top. So when you're reeling this in, just kind of a medium retrieve. This keeps it elevated up on the top. So this is creating that gurgle. Good colors for smallmouth, whites and chartreuses. Um, and then you can go with a, a spinner bait as well. Again, the smaller ones, this is pretty big. This is going to be more of a quarter ounce spinner bait. So a little too heavy going to get down lower in the water column you're probably going to get hung up but uh smallmouth will give chase to these kind of fleshy type baits jig jigs uh bladed jigs um top water baits like a buzz bait just something that's got a skirt on it they'll give chase you can get some bigger ones but again you're not going to catch very many fish using something like this but they are an option so if you have them in your box Again, early morning hours, you want to burn a spinner bait, you want to burn a topwater bait, that's the time to do it. Once we, once you get to about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, that sun gets up all the way through until about dusk. We're really wanting to get back down subsurface, target structure, target runs, riffles, eddies, seams, just anywhere where those fish can be kind of hunkered down in ambush positions. But the early morning and late evening hours, you might be able to burn a spinner bait topwater bait and have some success. Same thing goes for your hard baits. So any type of crankbait. Um, these are all going to be a little big, but if you're going to run a crankbait in a creek, probably going to want to be sticking with something that's more in a crawfish pattern than a bait fish pattern. Um, kind of hung up here. 
to get you free. But a lipless crankbait, something like this. I don't know if I'm going to get those untangled. Just a very basic crawfish. So this is a half ounce. It's too heavy. You're going to look, if you're buying a, a rattle trap, a lipless crankbait, you're looking for the um, probably an eighth ounce, but definitely no more than a quarter ounce. The half ounce one, you're going to dive deep. You got two treble hooks. Even though it's cobble bottom in most of these areas, hard bottom, you're still more apt to find logs, lay downs, any type of grass, more likely than not other fishing line. Um, that just finding fishing line, ripping treble hooks, uh, especially in popular public access areas. That's just kind of the, the draw. But here's a good good box of lipless crankbaits for smallmouth. Lots of red colors for our crawfish some gold, some chartreuse, kind of some basic uh, matching our darters and shiners, but not going to be your most effective baits. But if you have these, especially in some of the deeper water of Blue River, Illinois, um, deeper holes down near towards the lake, uh, you can get into some, some fish, but you get good bycatch down there. You're going to find some white bass, some hybrid striped bass, uh, especially on the Illinois River. Again, just a bunch of lipless crankbaits and different types of shad patterns. So anything that's got a silver flash on it, a uh, little bit of chartreuse in it, a little bit of red, uh, those are going to be the colors that you're looking for for your hard baits if you're going to run those for smallmouth. Uh, our diving crankbaits in our smaller creeks, Rock Creek, um, Barren Fork, you could run a smaller, kind of like a panfish crankbait, something in here, especially like this one over here, this kind of brown crawdad with a little red belly, something like that. Those could be effective for you if you wanted to run a hard bait in that shallower, slower moving water. These are only going to dive a couple of feet, so they're not going to get all the way down to the bottom. And you might get some aggressive fish that'll come and take that. Definitely get a lot of sunfish that'll come and look at that. Um, Bigger crankbaits, if you're on the Illinois or on Blue River, uh, maybe on the Glover or the Mountain Fork, something that's got a little bit deeper water in certain areas, you could elect for a crankbait. If you're getting, if you're going to use a crankbait in something like that, if it's not going to be a straight crawfish pattern, be looking for something that's got a lot of yellow, purple, trying to match our long ear sunfish. So here is a long ear sunfish replicator right here. We got just the total pattern of a long ear sunfish. So this is going to be a pretty good bait source for smallmouth bass in the eastern half of the state. Um, you see a lot of these long ear, especially in like Barren Fork, you catch a lot of them. Um, you catch a lot of them in the Blue River. So something in a bluegill pattern or a crawfish pattern. But again, square bill, no deeper than five foot divers. Early morning, late evening, you can run these and you can get some aggressive fish to come after them. But all the stuff we're going to get to are soft plastics. Those are really, you don't need anything else other than that. These baits are expensive. They're susceptible to getting hung up. And in some areas, unless you're willing to go for a swim, you might not get them back. So it's just easier to use cheap jig heads, soft plastics. You're going to get plenty of use out of them. Um, so... From, these are a little bit deeper divers, but if you got a smaller, so these are going to be probably too deep. These are going to be more medium diver baits that are going to get in that five to 10 foot range, but something in a pattern like this, just black, brown, gray crawfish, brown, red, burnt, orange crawfish pattern. Um, and then maybe a, try a, something in a bright red crawfish pattern. If you wanted to throw a hard bait. Again, not really necessary, but you got something like that in your tackle box. Worth a shot if you happen to get out on the river. So not really, oh, we got one more box of these. Let's see, kind of more of the same. Here's some shallow diver. There's that long ear again. Really shallow diver, square bill, something like that. And then smallmouth are kind of notorious for going after chartreuse colors. So maybe something like this. Dark back, chartreuse, a little red slash on it. 
Find fish using those for sure, but not as effective. Um, the one hard bait you might find some success with, but it's a little bit harder to fish, especially if you're in really fast moving current, are going to be your jerk baits. Jerk baits are really good for smallmouth. So if you ever if you're ever out on a lake for smallmouth, like Arbuckle, Skyatuk, Latonka, really good smallmouth bass lakes in the state. Uh, pretty much anything in this box. Any any long long slender. Most of the ones in here are going to be uh, Rapala rip stops. They got the little tail on the back that stop them. Uh, but any any color in here. So we've got kind of our uh, silvers with our blue backs and then they kind of get darker in through here. We got some purples, some yellow, some chartreuses, and then some kind of some hotter colors like bright orange, bright yellow. Really good for lake smallmouth, but you can ding some in the river. They're just a little bit harder to fish because you're trying to stop them and the water's working against you. So if you can find like the back end of a run, uh, any kind of seam line, off of a pool, you might find some success with uh, jerk baits. But again, expensive. Find a lot of hangups with all those treble hooks. Um, kind of more of the same in that box. Some other good ones that are kind of good multi-purpose are just the original uh, Rapala, either floating or sinking minnow. So this is again, you can fish it as a jerk as a jerk bait, or you can fish it as just a straight crankbait. Slow, steady retrieve, it's gonna wobble, or you can crank it through the water. Um, the ones that are sinking are gonna stop and they're gonna slowly do that. The floating ones are gonna do that and they're gonna slowly come up. They probably sell some of these now that are suspending, so they go and they're meant to just kind of sit there until you jerk them again. Um, but the original Rapala Minnow. Always a good river bait, no matter where you go. That's good for big brown trout over on the White River in Arkansas. It's good for smallmouth. Um, but let's see. So here's the last of kind of the hard baits. These are kind of the, the hybrids because they're not true hard baits. But your jigs. So your bass jigs, something, something like this in your basic color. Lots of different options. You can have a shaky head. You could have a swim head. You could have a football head. Anything that's going to look like a, you know, sunfish pattern. Um, I don't use a lot of like black and blue. You That is a color choice. Uh, but for smallmouth, I tend to stick more with olives, red and black. Um, so this is a little Ned head jig. This is really what I'd be looking to use if I was going to use something like that. This is just a little bit too big of a bait profile especially with that hook size, a lot of the fish that we're going to be catching are going to be in that six to 14 inch range. They can get up over that hook point, but it's a lot easier for them to get up over that hook point compared to that. So about a quarter of the size of that hook point. And this one's got a net head on it. So this comes down right on the bottom. You could fish this just with the skirt on it. You could put a little trailer it's got a little bait holding clip up on the shank. Um, but if I was going to use just a straight jig with no blade on it, I would be looking at using something that was like this. That's going to be, this is going to be about a one sixth ounce, one eighth ounce. Uh, these Ned heads, Z-Man, they have odd uh, numbered jig heads. So like one fifth, one sixth, one tenth, one fifteenth. This is going to be a one six. So this is good to just throw out there, bang it down along the bottom. You can hop it up and down. You can let it just go right to the bottom. Like if you were in a pool and you're fishing downstream and you cast in that pool, you just let it fall down to the bottom and catch the seam line. And you can just slowly retrieve it right down along the bottom. It's going to look like a little crawfish. So if you put just a little like twin tail grub on the back end of it or something like that, that's all twin tails are great to throw off of any trailer that you're going to use, whether it's a crawfish, uh, twin tail grub, skirted twin tail, uh, little, you know, what they call like the pork to throw on the end. Um, anything that's got twin tails, that's just a little, uh, trailer is going to work great in streams. Cause it's either going to mimic bait fish down along the bottom, or it's going to mimic crawfish, both small mouth, uh, on the menu. So, Something like that. I really like that one right there. Uh, 
And then if you want to just cast and retrieve, so if that river is a little bit elevated, a uh, little dingier water, something like that, switching over to like an eighth ounce or quarter ounce bladed jig. So most bladed jigs that you find in most uh, retailers, especially if it's not a like a Bass Pro where they got lots of options, it's going to be a Z-Man Chatterbait, which is what this is. Again, really natural color, olive base with a green pumpkin, red and black flake, like three to five inch stick worm behind it. You just cast these straight cross current, maybe a little bit upstream and just kind of a medium retrieve in. It's going to create a lot of vibration in the bottom. You can bang them down along the bottom, bigger bait profile. But in some of the bigger holes, deeper holes and runs in a river, something like this can find you a really big fish. But again, these probably only if the water is super elevated um, or just a little dingy where I want to make a little bit of noise where they would typically be held up if I'm using what I typically use, which is what we're going to get into. Um, I'm just trying to create a little bit extra action. You can go the exact opposite route and go for complete reactionary and go with like a white trailer or chartreuse trailer on a white or chartreuse uh, bladed jig. But just like the crankbaits and the topwater, more often than not, these baits are going to be most effective first thing in the morning, last thing in the evening when those fish are really willing to be aggressive and chase up into that shallow water. Most of the time they're looking to just grab something, a quick dart out. Um, you'll get some smaller fish, especially on like Barren Fork where there's not a lot of fishing pressure uh, and there's not a lot of predation because it's primarily smallmouth. Uh, they, the little ones will chase stuff all the way in underneath your legs. But when you get into the bigger rivers looking for some of those bigger fish, uh, typically it's not until early morning, late evening hours that you really get them aggressive on that unless the water is elevated and stained. So our next batch of our kind of non-traditional, these will catch a lot of multi-species um, and we'll still catch smallmouth. They're going to be our swim baits. Uh, so anything like a curly tail grub, little baby shad, little sassy shad, bumper tail grubs, anything uh, that's just, you know, going to pulse through the water. So here's a box of just some different little kind of boot tail grubs and swim baits. But something, something flashy like this, chartreuse. This will get a reactionary bite, but again, early mornings, late evenings, trying to get those reactionary bites if you're going to be working baits back into you. Um, most of the stuff that I'm going to show as we get farther into this with the baits that are really going to be effective for smallmouth, you're really fishing seam lines. You're kind of letting it dead drift or you're working it along the bottom. All these baits that I've shown till this point are reactionary bites. You're working the lure. You're trying to get a fish to come and chase. Uh, or you're trying to get them from an ambush spot to either come up and hit. But if you got any type of grubs, especially something chartreuse, something just in a basic bait fish pattern, you throw these out into creeks and rivers in Oklahoma, you're going to find fish. It might not always be smallmouth. You're going to catch spotted bass, largemouth, panfish, crappie, white bass, um, walleye. If, you, if there's walleye, like in the mountain fork where there's walleye, you could get walleye on something like this. Um, but they are an option swim bait. You can never go wrong with the swim bait. So any type of curly tail grub, boot tail grub, boot tail swim bait, uh, just anything that's got a little bumper that's going to kick through the water, but you're really looking to stick to eighth ounce and under 16th ounce is my preferred weight. If I, for most situations, if I'm on a river, um, here's just some sassy shad. So Basic colors again, got our flashy color over here, little flashy color here, and then everything else is pretty natural, just bait fish shad patterns. Not your most ideal bait for smallmouth, you will catch them on it, but that's what you got. You're at a place like Horseshoe Bend, um, you're in the Mountain Fork where there's some other species, Illinois River where there's some other species, you're going to get, you know, some bycatch, whether it be white bass or sawgye, walleye hybrids um and then you're also going to pick up some bass here and there grubs 
do I have? Not there in the other box. So here's just some very basic grubs. 16th ounce, eighth ounce jig head. Pretty much the same thing as like some of our swim baits. But I would go with the chartreuse if you're looking to pick off a predatory smallmouth. If you're looking to just pick up a bunch of fish, something on either a road runner head or just a basic ball jig head in a natural color. Just a brown, some black flake, green pumpkin. Those are going to be your best base colors for just trolling or uh, throwing out and steadily retrieving a grub. That's going to be your best bet. But something white, it's hard to beat white or silver if you're just trying to catch fish. Um, if you don't know what to throw, new to fishing, little white or brown grub, 16th ounce jig head, throw it in a creek or river. You're going to catch fish. Um, and then for more of like our pan fish species, but these will, again, smallmouth are going to hit just about anything that they can get a hold of. But uh, some like bluegrass baby shad, something like this, you're going to catch a lot of sunfish on a bait like this. Really small profile, only about an inch long, inch and a half. 32nd ounce, 16th ounce jig head. And it'll look something like this is a 32nd ounce jig head on that one. So real small. And you just cast these out. Light action, four, six pound test. Real slow, steady retrieve. You'll get fish come up behind them. But pretty much any color of baby shad that's somewhat natural. Bluegrass, chartreuse, um, green and chartreuse. Something like that. Those are always going to catch fish. So kids, new anglers, just looking for something to toss around. 16th ounce jig head, 32nd ounce jig head, probably a 16th ounce. 32nd ounce are pretty hard to throw unless you're using light action with four pound test and you have the right equipment for it. Otherwise, you're probably going to get bird's nest because it's going to be too light of line to throw out. But can't go wrong with those for just picking up fish to catch. Um... All right, the last of our swim baits here before we move along. Now, these ones are what I like to throw if I'm looking for some big small mouth and I've, they've been shown to be aggressive during the day. It's going to be a fluke. So a three to a five inch fluke. I like Zoom super flukes. It's a five and quarter inch. It's what this guy is right here. And what I do with these is I uh, rig them weightless and weedless and I throw them cross current to the, to the bank, you know, especially if there's current moving along like some rocks, any rocky outcropping, some structure that's poked out. Uh, I'm going to take a three aught to five aught offset hook, something like this. And all you're going to do is go right through the nose with the hook point and come out the belly side about half an inch in, work that up the hook shank and it'll turn once it gets up above the collar. And then you just put that hook point down through the bottom of the bait, pull it out dead square in the back. And then to make it weedless, so that hook point right there all you're gonna do is just pull the plastic forward a little bit and then let it fall back and all all you do with this you cast it straight cross current maybe just a little bit upstream but you want to land it on the back side of the fast moving water and what happens is, is your line gets caught in the water so when this thing hits it's going to sit right up on the film and it's going to slowly try to sink and depending on how fast the water's moving you know it could sink halfway middle of the water column before you go to retrieve it or it's going to stay way up high but this is basically a dying fish up on the top and when that water catches your line all it does is it just whips this through the water so you get all that action from the tail and you'll see the smallmouth shoot out of nowhere and come up when i fish over in arkansas and missouri this is my go-to for big fish um, on the back sides of seams and things like that. So typically if I'm floating, uh, I have three rods with me. One's a very light action rod with like a 32nd ounce, inch and a half tube on it. Another one's going to be like a medium light action rod with maybe like a two and a half inch tube on it. And then 
My third one is either going to be a medium action spinning outfit or a medium action bait casting outfit to throw this. Um, but I always have, especially if I'm over on like Crooked Creek in Arkansas, uh, Kings River, any of the where you can get some bigger smallmouth, the Buffalo River over there. But the Illinois River, you can do the same exact thing, but you're just wanting to cast that on the backside of where the current's ripping and let the current do the work for you. You're, all you're really doing is just picking up your line. You're not doing a whole lot. You're just letting it drift and flip. And most of the time it stays high enough up in the water column where it's almost like a top water bite. You'll see that fish surface to come grab it. But it just looks like a dying shad going down the water um, on the top. That's just getting ripped down by the current. So that that's if there was one non because we've made it through everything to our soft plastics of everything I've shown. That was the first thing where that's what I use. Um, everything else that I've shown, it'll catch fish, um, but it's just not your most productive artificial bait. If you wanted to go the live bait option, whether that's turning over rocks, looking for crawdads, helgramites, anything like that, um, you're just looking to throw some type of medium size bait holding hook. Something that looks like, like this. It's a very basic medium size bait holding hook. You can put a minnow on this. You can thread a night crawler onto that. You can put a crawfish on that, a helgramite, crickets, uh, grasshoppers, and you can hold this off the bottom with a leader line to a swivel, either throwing like, if you're in current, you're probably gonna need like a quarter ounce weight. Shouldn't need more than a half ounce weight because you, you really wanna get it right on the seam. You don't want it sitting out where the water's rushing. Um, you just can't hold your line down. So you can either use a casting weight up above a swivel. So you put this on your main line, tie it to one end of the swivel, and then you'd have your leader so if you didn't have a spool of line with you, just cut off like two feet of line from your main line and set it aside. Then put your weight on, could either be something like that or a bullet weight, no roll weight, whatever weight you like to throw out to hold bait on the bottom. Then tie it to one end of the swivel, then tie your leader line to that end of the swivel and then tie your hook on. Um, and then you would just thread, you know, if you're using a crawdad, you probably just hook them right through the tail and just let them sit out there. Crickets, grasshoppers, just right through the middle of them. Uh, minnows, right behind the dorsal fin. And then night crawlers, you just thread them on and then maybe leave like that much a worm, just flapping on the back. But that's going to be your your best choice for bait. Um, and you'll catch smallmouth doing that, uh, but you're going to catch a lot of like other kind of cool fish. If you want to go after like river suckers, some of the bigger fish that are in the water, most of the bigger fish in the bodies of water in Oklahoma that are clear water streams are going to be non-game fish. Um, you can go with a little bit smaller hook. I really like a, a wide gap octopus hook. So this is going to be a little bit smaller than that other hook that we just showed, but this is still pretty big. This is going to be like a one-aught hook, um, but you can size down and use size one, size two octopus hooks something like this. we got that nice wide gap on it, but throwing a cricket on that, a little piece of worm off the bottom, you can catch some really nice drum, buffalo, river suckers, smallmouth, sunfish, pretty much anything in the water. If you're throwing bait out there, you're going to catch fish. Um, so if you're just looking to go somewhere in camp, stay on the riverside, just have bait out there, quarter ounce to half ounce, uh, casting weight or egg weight or no roll weight put on with either a medium sized bait holding hook. I like oct small octopus hooks. Try to get a thick wire hook because you might hook into a, you know, a substantial size river sucker or something like that, that um, a small, like an Aberdeen hook, something that looks like something that looks like this, which is a good size profile for your hook, but this is a thin wire hook. So I can bend that with my fingers. You don't want to be able to bend it because if you hit into a carp or a drum or 
just something that's got a lot of power behind it, it's going to straighten that hook right out. But you can use a really small, a much smaller hook than that that's a thick wire octopus hook or circle hook, and they're not going to be able to straighten it out. So that's a good option. Um, if you're just camping, got kids, you just want to get lines in the water, don't want to really do a whole lot of casting and retrieving. Um, night crawlers are the way to go or red worms. You can get those easily at any Walmart bait store, but you can always use bait that you find. And it's great to use bait from the river itself. So turning rocks over, finding small crawfish or helgramites, little stone flies, uh, walking along the bank, getting a bunch of grasshoppers or crickets, putting them on the hook. Those work great. Um, and it's fun for kids. And anytime you're using live bait, you have the opportunity to catch some bigger fish that aren't necessarily smallmouth. So always a good option for bycatch. All right. So let's get into now kind of the smallmouth portion of, of this course. Um, I've got six, seven, eight. I've got nine boxes here and they pretty much all have the same stuff in them. Um, and we're going to talk about how you target these smallmouth. So Oklahoma, we have a lot of clear water streams, um, all in the Eastern half of the state, uh, or East of I-35 all the way from up North down to the Red River. There's clear water streams mixed in all through that. Problem is we don't have a lot of public access to those streams. Um, private landowner laws throughout the state. Nobody owns the water. So if you can access the water publicly and be floating, you are legal. The second you get out of whatever you're floating in and touch the stream bed, you're trespassing. Uh, we don't have portage laws in the state, so you can't get out. You can't traverse through people's property. You can't traverse the stream bed. So that kind of limits your options of where you're able to fish if you don't have access to private property on clear water streams. So our main access points. Um, over in the chat, I put our uh, smallmouth stream angler guide that's going live to the public on June 1st. I take, uh, I'd recommend taking a look at that. You could pop it up right now on, a, on another tab uh, if you're on a desktop or on a phone, if you can do that. But um, that's going to have all the major public access places with direct Google links to the access site themselves. So whatever your default mapping system on your laptop, desktop, tablet, mobile device, it's going to take you right to it. So those are going to be all of our major smallmouth bass spots in the entire state that you can creek or river access. Um, the Illinois, you can float. Great River um, gets a lot of float traffic in the summer. So typically, if you want to make a day out of actually getting after it fishing you probably want to go midweek like a wednesday um but i've caught plenty of fish in the middle of summer on a saturday with a thousand boats flying down um it's just the fish just kind of move into different areas so if you're gonna target the illinois best time of year to do it is may before memorial day wind flows are not elevated so on the illinois river you're looking at cfs between 600 and a thousand that's going to be the that kind of good water flow it's going to be clear you start getting over a thousand still going to be fairly clear it's easy to wade um but it's going to start to get dingy after you get over a thousand cfs so like today it's at like 2400 after the rains we got earlier this week and it was at second highest flood stage it's ever been at like three weeks ago so it's still trying to settle Typically in Oklahoma, we get mid-May, June, unless you're going to Barron Fork, Rock Creek, areas that really clear out fast. Blue River doesn't catch a ton of water most of the time. Illinois, you typically have to wait until about July because we just get so much rain on the eastern half of the state, latter half of May, all through June, that it just it can never stabilize to the point that you can really target fish effectively. You can still catch them. It's just you really got to know that river well to know where they move when that water gets elevated. But once we get into that sweet spot, 600 to 1,000 CFS, which is going to be all through the summer and into the fall, um, you've got great public access. So there is, you know, a dozen public access sites along that river from the Chewy Bridge all the way down to Horseshoe Bend. Most productive part of the Illinois River 
by and large is going to be from Round Hollow to Peavine, which is kind of the northern section. It's below Chewy Bridge. Anything uh, east of Chewy Bridge, north and east, uh, I think there's maybe one public access up there, but it goes to Arkansas from there. There's good fishing in there. There's just not good public access. Everything below Chewy Bridge is all pretty much public access all the way through that. So you're good to float, wet wade, float and wet wade. Um, it's just a great section of river if you you know want to go target bass. Uh, but what you're looking for on the Illinois, especially in the summertime when they start to get float traffic, you got to look for wood. So any type of tree that's fallen down, uh, not necessarily log jams. You're looking for mid-river, uh, like lay downs, lay downs that have been pushed over into shallow water. So when the river's making a big turn and then it's turning again and it might get up into like some very shallow tail out water and maybe even into like some back water where it's drifting over the riffles into kind of a mini run pool that turns into bigger water. A lot of times what happens in the summer, especially during float traffic, is all of those rafts and kayaks and float tubes and everything else that are out there, they're in the main current. So they're out in that four to 10 feet of water, just staying in the current. Well, unless you're actively paddling to get yourself into shallow water, the current itself is not pushing the boats over into that. So what ends up happening is you get those fish they pull out of what looks like really fishy water up against log jams, cut banks and runs because they're just getting boats over them all day long. People are in the water with their legs dangling. So all those fish do is they'll suck over. And if they can find shade and wood with a little bit of current, they're still getting that feeding line that comes down. So the best fishing for smallmouth on the Illinois during the summer is going to be the shallow water. It's going to be where you can find woody laydowns, uh, the one thing you're really looking for is when you get the the real shallow water after it's come out of a deep run and it's making a turn a lot of times because the river channel is so wide because of the flood zone you'll get kind of these dredged out cobble where unless you know what you're looking for it's really not that noticeable but if you have the main river coming down and the current is on one side of the river and it's clearly pushing through real shallow water and trying to get into that next pool or run section. But there's a lot of water, like it's really spread out, and you're still current moving to that other side. What'll happen is it'll dig out just these little ditches that go through there, and they don't look like much. Sometimes there's not even structure. And those fish will just sit right in that because float traffic is typically away from it. It's just a good place to um, have food that goes right to them. So Anytime you're on the Illinois, do never overlook the shallow water, especially during the summertime when it's float season. Shallow water with wood, that's what you're looking for. And all these baits that we're going to show, I'm going to tell you how to fish them, and they're going to work along those areas. But that's really what you're looking to target. Now, if you can float it early May, late April, early May, and then again in like late September all the way through October when the water starts to cool down again and the floaters aren't as active out there, then you can start targeting more of those mid-river runs, big pools that dump in where you can stand in water this deep as it dumps into the pool and fish straight downstream and drag the stream bottom. Um, but anytime you get all that float traffic out there, you really just got to look for those shallow tailings and any type of shady cover, especially if there's wood, boulders, rocky outcroppings, that's where those fish are going to sit. Um, Rock Creek which is a small tributary that runs right behind Veterans Lake in the Chickasaw National Recreation Area in Sulphur. It runs right into the northwest end of Arbuckle Lake. Spring-fed Creek, you basically you go in and you follow the signs to Veterans Lake. If you look at the smallmouth anglers guide that I put in the chat, it's going to give you all the direct locations to it. But basically when you park, you get right down onto the creek and you start walking downstream. Um, there's not a lot to that creek for the first probably 100, 150, maybe even 200 yards downstream. It's really tight. Every now and then there's some bass mixed in there, but it's mostly sunfish. As you continue to walk downstream and kind of walk through this kind of tight braided water, it'll start to form out into a slow moving channel with some quicker little riffle sections, but it, it really slows down. Once you get to that, then you start finding the bass. 
it's a mixture of largemouth, spotted bass, and smallmouth. Um, I fished it a, a few times. I found a lot of smallmouth on one trip. The next one, I found a ton of spotted bass. Um, so those fish, they have easy access to and from the north end of the lake. So you just get a lot of fish that are going to suck up in the summertime. Um, and you can walk all the way downstream, basically to the last bend at the mouth. Uh, once you get to that, you can't go any farther and you've already gone past where your takeout point is. Again, in that guide, there's a takeout point, which is a dry creek bed that you have to hit to get back up to the road. Otherwise, you have to walk back up river because there's really no bank to walk. It's super thick. You have to be in the water the whole time. But it's a pretty cool, you have the whole place to yourself. There's never going to be anybody else fishing down there. So you can walk down a mile, maybe a mile and a half of fishing. So you get a good three, four hours of fishing. Um, the only thing is, is, even in the summertime, there's a couple of holes where the water is kind of channel goes out. You either got to bushwhack or you got to swim to keep going downstream because it'll get to where it's up here. For the most part, it's only no, no more than waist deep. Um, in the deepest parts where you're walking downstream. But there is a couple of sections before you get to that dry creek bed to walk back up to the road um, where you either have to swim or bushwhack. But it's a fun little fish if you're ever down spending the day at Arbuckle Lake or camping at the Chickasaw uh, NRA. It's pretty cool. Um, Blue River, obviously, is our kind of premier uh, public access to river in the state. We have about six and a half miles of continuous river. Blue river is great. There's lots of different water. Um, there are smallmouth all throughout it. Like I said, there's not that many in there overall. Uh, you know, it's not, if you go fishing, most trips that I have there are almost all spotted bass, like 95% spotted bass with 5% smallmouth, but the 5% smallmouth in a good day, that's five to 10 fish. Um, and, most of the time they're pretty decent size. Uh, just fished it a few weeks ago and I caught more smallmouth than I've ever caught in one trip and they were all juveniles. So that was really nice to see because I almost never catch last year's year, year class or two, three year old fish. Um, smallmouth bass, just river bass in general, they, they are very slow growth period. So to get a fish to 14 inches, takes six, seven years to get a fish to 16 inches, seven, eight years to get a fish up to 18 inches, which is a, you know, trophy river fish. If you can get to 18 inches, which that's only happening on barren or on Illinois blue river, maybe the Glover mountain fork, maybe, but that's getting pretty big down there as well. Um, that takes 10 years to get a fish to grow to that size. So seeing the crop coming up in Blue River was a very nice thing to see because I, I have not seen that previously to that extent. Um, but lots of spotted bass in there. Six to 14 inches. They're a ton of fun. You're going to catch them all over the place. You're going to catch a bunch of sunfish mixed in. Um, but there's lots of good sections of water for Blue River. The section above Highway 7, so the northern end of the property, you're going to get into a lot of the deeper water waterfalls going into really long deep runs big pools down at the bottom you're going to find some of your bigger fish up in those sections working across and basically all you're doing is just walking the trails and then walking out on the waterfalls and fishing all of the water around the waterfalls um, and you just kind of keep doing that if you go down to the middle section or the southern section of the property where the campgrounds are at the low water crossing is when you get in there, everything below the low water crossing, there are some bass to pick off in there. It's just not as productive during the warm water season. Um, lots of swimmers, lots of water traffic down there. Not a lot of people fish it during the summertime. Some people will catfish, but not a lot of bass angling. Um, so you pretty much have the river to yourself most of the time. But if you go down towards the low water and you get to the big gravel parking lot, you go left towards the campgrounds, there's a road that kicks back up onto the hill and you park up on the top of the hill and you walk down to the river and that's Desperado Spring. All of that is real small braided pocket water. So the river channel might have six, seven different braids of water with little islands that could be 15 feet long or they could be 
150 yards long. Um, it just depends. And it just kind of cuts its way in through there. There is some deeper water in there. I mean, you can find six, eight feet of water in it. Uh, most of the water is going to average a foot to four feet through there, but there are a ton of fish in there. Um, every now and then you find some really good pockets of some decent size, smallmouth, two, three pound smallmouth, um, but tons and tons of just those cookie cutter, 10, 12, 14 inch spotted bass. And you're just fishing every single pocket. And you usually pull one fish out of a pocket, move on to the next one. Um, when you can find areas that maybe have a little bit more water, maybe there's a piece of structure, a log, a big cut piece of rock or bank where the current comes over and they can stack in there. If you catch one, dart right back. You get bit again, keep casting until you stop getting bit. Um, otherwise, it's just cast, catch the fish, go to the next spot, go to the next spot. Go. To, you just keep working your way up river. Um, and in 95% of river fishing, you are always fishing up river. So you want to be approaching where you're fishing from downstream and preferably from the shallow side of downstream. So you're not stirring up the water. You're not creating a lot of disturbances. So you're not spooking fish. But anytime you're walking up those runs, make casts as you're walking. Because what will happen is a lot of times those big fish will suck back into the shallow tailings and you end up walking right through those fish thinking that, oh, the big fish will be in the deeper part of the run. But in reality, those bigger fish like to kind of be by themselves. Have you ever noticed um, in schooling fish and even predator ambush size fish, most of the time fish like to be around other fish of the same size. Um, they do it for safety because they can group up so they're safe from predators. And I think they just feel comfortable being around other fish their size. They don't feel that threat. So what will happen in a river where you don't have a ton of 14, 16 inch fish if there's just one in one home pool or home run, that fish tends to suck away from everything else. And a lot of times it's in the shallow shaded area at the very back end where it just looks like it's that deep of water and you'll go walking and all of a sudden you'll see a big fish go shooting out of it. So always make casts as you're working your way upstream. The only uh, exception being is when you're fishing a pool and you're fishing it from upstream down. And that's because the water's this deep in the riffle where it dumps into the pool. And you're just trying to position yourself where you can cast straight down current without knocking a bunch of sentiment and disturbances into the pool. And then you're letting your bait fall down to the bottom and you're either slowly retrieving it along the uh, stream bed or you're popping it up off the bottom and letting it fall or you're just slowly jigging it and then picking up your slack slowly. But that's the only exception. Everything else we're casting upstream or at least cross current and we're working the bait back towards us or letting it drift downstream. Um, so the only other spot in Blue River that can be pretty productive, uh, it's the most bushwhacking that you're going to get. It's below the Highway 7 bridge. So on the southwest side of Highway 7, there's a parking area and you can walk all the way down to some falls and you can fish those falls in the summertime when the water is normal, 100 CFS, 150 CFS, somewhere in there. Water's low enough, you can wet wade the entire river back up to where you can see the bridge. Once you can see the bridge, you have to cut out to the left. There's kind of this little creek channel that diverts and you can see the road, and but it's thick. So wearing water pants because of poison ivy, there's venomous snakes, there's ticks, there's chiggers. It's not a path. I mean, you're walking through four foot Johnson grass to get back up to the road after walking through 20 yards of riparian zone undergrowth thickets that have all sorts of different poison plants and venomous snakes. So not for the faint of heart in that section, but there's plenty of family uh, friendly areas down by the campgrounds, up above Highway 7, lots of well-beaten paths. But if you want to get off the beaten path and fish some pretty cool water, that section below Highway 7, but definitely take caution when you're wading through that because there's multitude of hazards. Um, Barren Fork Creek. So Barren Fork Creek is our, that's our top-notch smallmouth place. You can't, that it's almost exclusively smallmouth. So you want to go somewhere and just catch smallmouth bass. All you're catching is Neosho strain smallmouth. Um, a big fish in that Creek is going to be 15, 16 inches. Um, 
can they get bigger? They can, but I mean, if you, you hit a 16 inch fish in Baron Fork, that is a, I mean, you've done something that day. That is a trophy fish. Um, getting those fish in the 12 to 14 inch range are the ones that will turn your rod over. And those are awesome. But most of the fish are going to be somewhere between six and 12 inches. So that's why four to six pound test, light action rods, medium light action rods, uh, that you're just going to get the most fun and most play out of that. But a day on Baron Fork uh, at any of our public properties, there's five public accesses along the river, basically from the Arkansas line all the way to the confluence with the Illinois. So they're pretty well spaced out all through there. Um, we own two of those properties, the Thomas A. Bamberger Senior WMA and the Baron Fork uh, WMA. Both of them have a good chunk of uh, public waiting access that you can do through that. Um, water averages about two feet deep. There are deeper holes that are going to go, you know, up to maybe eight, maybe even 10 feet in some of them that are really dredged out. But for the most part, you're looking at two to four feet of water. So it's perfect. Big, nice gravel bars. Water's not moving more than about 200, 300 CFS during the summer. So it's just a trickle. Um, super. It's a great place to start uh, wet wade fishing in Oklahoma. So taking kids, taking somebody new, you know, if you've never streamed fish before, that is the place to start because you're going to catch fish. You're going to catch a lot of fish. Um, there's not a lot of hazards, if any, you know, you're in the woods, always pay attention for buggy looking areas or snakes and things like that. But the water itself is perfect. Um, and that's, that's just the, it's one of my favorite spots in the entire state, but that's where you're going to catch the most amount of smallmouth in one day. Uh, the Illinois is probably a close second on a really good day. Um, and then our other areas are just kind of a mixture of different warm water species. So smallmouth are obviously what you're going to target, but you're going to catch a large mouth and spotted bass and sunfish and gar and drum and carp, uh, white bass, sog eye, walleye. Um, Barren Fork is the one place you go where it's like, some days you don't catch anything but smallmouth. You might catch one sunfish, but other than that, you're almost exclusively catching smallmouth. So um, that's a good one to go to. Then down in the far southeast, we have Mountain Fork, which has a couple of public access spots on the north, on the upper stretch above the lake in the National Forest right there, uh, the Washita WMA, the Shoals. But there's a couple of stretches, but it, again, it's a, that's pretty treacherous. You got to do a lot of walking through there. There's not a lot of easy bank waiting access. And then you can go into the Honobi and Three Rivers WMA complex, but you do need a land access permit to go in there. So if you're a resident, you have to you have to have a $40 annual permit. If you're a non-resident, I think it's $85. Um, but there's like 30 miles of rivers and streams that cut through all of those property. So the Glover River is kind of the heart of it, but there's a little river, Tons of little offshoot creeks of the Glover, lots and lots of smallmouth, spotted bass, largemouth, sunfish, flathead catfish, channel catfish. Just a, it's a great overall fishery. So if you're looking to just go somewhere and camp, kind of get away from everything, um, you can't camp on those properties, but you can camp in tons of nearby state parks. There's Pine Creek, McGee Creek, uh, Sardis. We own a couple of properties down there that have camping on it. Then there's lodging and uh, Corps of Engineers. There's tons and tons of camping areas down there. Um, but that's a good one where you can just kind of go get lost in the wilderness and just fish small creeks, bigger creeks. It's just cool to walk around and be able to catch a bunch of fish. Um, and that kind of, that's it. There's a few tributaries off of Grand, Sycamore Creek. Elk River doesn't really have any public access on it. You got to be in a boat. Uh, Buffalo Creek, there's one public access. Sycamore Creek's got one public access. You're going to find some smallmouth. They're going to be on the smaller side. And then again, lots of sunfish, maybe some spotted and largemouth bass. Um, but that really does it for the, the primary um, public access that we have in the state. Uh, so check out the smallmouth guide that's in the chat bar. It's going to give you all the places I just listed, all the top tips, all the areas to park, where to walk. Um, where you're going to find the most success. So with that, let's go through all of the smallmouth specific baits um, that we you'd use on any of those places uh, to find success. I'm going to start off with what 
I use exclusively. Um, really don't, don't stray that far anymore because I don't have to. Um, these catch fish and I usually am catching enough fish that I don't even think about changing what I'm doing. So everything else is just stuff I've used over the years and what are just common smallmouth baits that are going to find you fish. No, no questions asked. But if you want to go really stack up numbers of fish, especially on a place like Blue River, Barren Fork, Rock Creek, um, where you just, you want to catch smallmouth, but you will catch anything and you just want to have fish hooked up, you know, many casts as possible. Uh, that is going to be your inch and a half squirm and squirt tube right here on a 32nd ounce jig head. They make a two inch and they make a two and a quarter inch. This is the two inch. This is the inch and a half. I don't like the two inch. I Usually what I do with these is I rig them, but then I take my clippers and I chop off most of that tail. So I chop off about half of that tail and leave a little bit on there. So it's down to like that. Uh, where'd our inch one go? So probably cut a little too much off of that. Uh, but anyways, that's to get it down to that inch and a half profile. The only reason I say that is because when you do get sunfish, you want that hook point as close to the back of the bait as possible. If you give them this much, if you give them basically an inch, an inch and a half, a tag behind the hook point, those sunfish will come and they'll be hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And they're just going to start ripping those tentacles off and ripping the tentacles off. You're going to be getting bit all day long and wondering why you're not catching any fish, why you're not hooking up. Uh, it's just because they're grabbing the back end of that. They can't get over the top. So steer clear of the two inch, um, unless maybe you're in the Illinois. If you're in the Illinois and you get bass, they can get over that. But uh, if you're in Barren Fork or a smaller creek, don't throw the two inch because there's too many sunfish and they'll just destroy the end of that. So you'll get, you'll catch fish, but you're going to ruin the tube uh, quicker than you would if you're using an inch and a half. Um, you internally rig them. So let's try to find a hollow one. I don't know if any of these, these all might be rigged in here. Um, oh, here's one that's not. So here's an inch and a half that's not rigged. So it's a hollow body. So what you got to do with your jig head, here is a 32nd ounce jig head. Now these squirm and squirts, they're Bass Pro brand and they're, it's called Crappie Max and they're squirm and squirts. Well, they also make a squirt head. So this head was made to go with these tubes. You can find these at Bass Pro and Cabela's. Um, and what you do is you take, take the eye guide and just put it right in the cavity, the opening cavity, and then just start to work it in to the bait until you get the tip of the lead up to the top of the tube head. And then once you're up like that, then all you gotta do is just pull the plastic doesn't take a whole lot of pressure and you'll pop that eye guide right through. So what I'll do is they sell these in like a 15 pack. I'll just buy a 15 pack. I'll buy a 15 pack of the uh, heads that go with them. And then I put them right back into the soft plastic, put them in my chest pocket with a pair of clippers. And that's all I take. Um, especially if I'm going to like Rock Creek, Barren Fork, I don't take anything else. There's just no need for it. So how I fish these you can just straight cast them and retrieve them. That's that's how plenty of people that I've rigged these up for have fished them, and they catch plenty of fish. Um, what I like to do is I kind of fly fish them. Uh, I do throw them on my three weight occasionally, uh, which is pretty fun. But with my spinning outfit, what I'll do is I'm casting them. Again, I'm fishing upriver and letting the bait come back to me. So what I try to do is I want to cast it right into the main. I want to work all parts of the water. So I'll start making casts as I'm working my way up the tail out towards the run and towards the pool uh, and just making casts, fan casting, just making sure I'm hitting as much water as possible, starting with as close to me as I can, working my way across the river so I'm not throwing it over the back of anything. Um, 
And all I'm doing is I'm just letting it hit the water. And especially as I get into the deeper kind of quicker moving water, I'm casting 45 degrees upstream. And then I'm just slowly reeling and just kind of popping the rod, just very subtly, just, just barely moving that rod. So what it does is every time it catches the slack, when it catches the slack, it just kind of darts it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, but what I'm, what I'm really doing is I'm just allowing it to drift in the current. So it's slowly falling down, coming back towards me. And I'm just kind of giving it a little pop occasionally as it's falling until it gets all the way even with me. And then I'll give it a couple of retrieves and then I just rip it in. Every now and then you'll, you'll be ripping it in and you'll feel that line go tight because a little one decided to chase it and grab it before you got it out of the water. Um, but all, all I'm doing is drifting it just giving it pops and just letting it drift because what those fish are doing is they're sitting and they're looking upstream and in uh, water like Barren Fork, Barren Fork doesn't have a ton of structure in it. There are areas that have woody laydowns and things like that. But for the most part, the fish in Barren Fork are, they're out in open water. So they're sitting right where a pool where that riffle dumps into a pool and they'll be sitting right down on the bottom and they're looking up. And what they're looking for is as that water's coming in, it's dumping food and that food gets caught up in that back eddy on the bottom. So those fish are sitting down there on the bottom waiting for food to tumble down. So when you're working your tube or your bait and it's coming down into that section downstream, they're coming up and getting it. A lot of times I don't feel the bite because I'm not steadily retrieving it. I just see my line either get really tight or get slack. I'll see it start to move where it shouldn't be moving. And then I reel up and set the hook. That's fine if you can get your hooks out. Um, if you don't have a lot of confidence with getting the hook out, because like I said, it takes a long time to grow these fish. So we don't want to kill them if we don't have to. Uh, if you're throwing baits out there and letting them drift and you're not paying attention, we've all been guilty of it. You cast hear a bird, you see a deer or something, you're just watching, you're not paying attention, your line's going along, and then all of a sudden it's like, start to reel in, and that fish is, it's halfway down its gullet. If you can't get to it, cut the line, it'll, you know, hopefully rust out and fall out, but if you're just casting and retrieving, shouldn't be a problem. You're going to feel the thump, thump, or just the whack when they get behind it, but if you do drift them, you got to watch your line closely, because if you turn around or you get distracted they'll take that bait for a while you won't know you have that fish on there and then you realize that you got an eight inch fish with it all the way in the back of its throat um but the shallow tailing same deal it's like i'm just casting it up river so even when i'm in water like that i'm still just kind of letting it dead drift dead drift dead drift slow reel and popping it and letting it get even with me the one thing you're not really going to get is if you start casting downstream um and reeling up river if that bait's moving upriver, you might get a little fish. I mean, a little one, a four, six incher, come grab it because that's the only food it can get a hold of. Um, but your bigger fish, they're not going to chase that thing upriver. They're looking to ambush it as it comes by them. So casting upstream and just a steady retrieve back into you, letting it fall down to the bottom and steady retrieve in, or just letting it drift through the film and letting it fall down and letting those fish come get it is the best way to fish these. Um, you can take i'll just get into the other box there's other so this is this is my creek and river box this is all i take with me most places anymore if i'm not out on a lake on a boat um or fishing for something specific this goes with me to every creek river pond small lake in the state any anywhere anywhere in our region uh this is going with me and gives me gives me a few different options i can fish a drop shot i can fish Ned rig, jig head off the bottom, got some baby shad if there's crappie or sunfish that I'm trying to catch or just want to switch it up. And then I have some weights and some hooks if I want to fish with live bait off the bottom. Um, and I have everything just in one box that'll fit into my hoodie pocket or my back pocket or just a little tote bag. And I take that with me. So this is really what you're looking to get to when you go river fishing. Um, when you find baits that you're when you find baits that you're uh, confident in, um, you just want to put them in something like this. So that's what you're looking for. Let's see. All right. Um, 
so most of these boxes are pretty much the same. Start with this one. So here's some different options of our crawdads and some twin tail chompers. And I've got a few different setups of how you can fish these. But for the most part, what you're doing with anything, so like something like this, this is going to be like a big four inch chomper twin tail. It's got the skirt on the top. These are like garlic scented. This is a really good color pattern for Oklahoma, kind of that uh, long ear sunfish. Also, you know, can be mimicked as a crawfish. So these are great. I like to throw in these on just a basic jig head. So just like an eighth ounce or a quarter ounce jig head. Stinger hook, something like this. Um, and then all you're doing with these is you just go right in through the top of the bait with that hook point and bring it out uh, about mid body, maybe three quarters of the way down. And you want it to be perpendicular with your tail. So you don't want it coming out on the seam line of your tail. So when it's up there at the top and it's on there, it's just going to look like that. So your hook point is going to be coming out perpendicular to the tails. And with these, what's great with these is in big pools, especially like on the Illinois, cast them down river into those pools and let this fall down to the bottom. And you get that skirt and that skirt will pulse out. So it's either going to look like the, uh, the pectoral fins of a sunfish that's trying to swim and they'll just be pulsing along. Or you can just drag it along the stream bed and you're going to get those twin tails that are going to be just flopping along the top, just like that. And you can just drag this along the stream bed um, but what I've found to be fairly effective for smallmouth, especially the bigger ones, is you're just throwing it into that pool and letting it fall down to the bottom. And you're just slowly picking your rod up once it's hit the bottom. And all it's doing is just fluttering up just a little bit. And when crawfish, when they go to take off, they kind of do this like pulsing where they just are making a lot of action as they're trying to get upstream as they're moving away so as you're pulling it up all of even though your bait's moving pretty slow all of these appendages are just fluttering and this is a really good color scheme um just kind of a root beer green pepper is usually what it's labeled as different brands uh name things a little bit differently but that's really the base you're looking for most of this other stuff is just basic green pumpkin with like black flake in it black or red flake you could rig these the same way with those jig heads. Um, and again, you're just making sure the hook point is coming out perpendicular with your appendages. So hook point is facing off the flat end instead of on the side end like we would be with a grub. Um, but crawfish, river bugs, something like this. You can rig them just like we did with that chompers. Uh, or you could, if you want to Texas rig them, you can pretty much accomplish the same thing. Uh, put them on like we did the uh, the fluke earlier. You just put it in, you come out through the belly side, and then it'll turn when it goes up the hook shank. Work that hook point on, make it weedless. And then before you go to put your tie that to your main line, you just put your bullet weight on your main line. And then you, you know, you can put a peg on it, a stopper. Uh, or you can just let it free on your line and let that fall down to the bottom and then jig it up or drag that along the stream bottom. This just gives you a little bit bigger hook profile to get as opposed to a basic jig head. That's why I like these stinger jig heads because it's more like an offset bass hook. It's not like your typical, it's fine to just like a as opposed to like a basic jig head like this. So both eighth ounce, but you can see that the hook points, this one's a much wider gap hook, gives you a little bit more because those smallmouth, they're very acrobatic. That's the, the fun part of smallmouth is pound for pound, they're arguably the hardest hitting fish in freshwater. Um, so even the little seven, eight inch fish are turning line over and bending rods over and throwing hooks and going airborne. So I, I had found in the past that using just a basic round ball jig head like this with a grub on it, I had more hooks thrown on me than I did when I started using 
stinger jig heads, wide gap jig heads, or just an offset hook with a bullet weight, something like that. But these are, this is pretty much the color scheme you're going to see throughout. Watermelon, red and black flake, uh, green pumpkin, orange and black, maybe black and red, something like this. It's a good one. Black with some blue and red flake in it. But that's going to be it. You're not really going to see a whole lot of delineation between maybe some chartreuses and some whites. Uh, your main color patterns are going to be shades of dark green, black, and brown, and orange. Um, the orange, because of the long ear sunfish and some crawfish and helgramites and other things that are going to have those shades. But those are your four shades. So if you're just buying different types of smallmouth looky uh, soft plastics, whether it be grubs, twin tail grubs, creature baits. If you're sticking to a dark green, brown, black, or orange base with some type of black, green, red flakes that are mixed into it, that is that you're in a great starting position from just that. Um, so this is more of our twin tail box. So pretty common colors in here. We got our whites and chartreuses, but then we got those green pumpkins, and then our root beer green pepper flake, which again is more of an orange base. So this is a Fat Albert grub. These are great. This is that root beer uh, green pepper flake. Only problem is, is they discontinued this color. So you can find a close color for these from Bass Pro's generic brand. Um, it's just a little bit darker. Just a shade darker, but pretty close. So here's Bass Pro. Here's the Zoom Fat Albert. So Bass Pro still makes this color scheme. This is a this is a dynamite one. Um, if you're just looking to go out, you're the type of person you just want to make a lot of casts and not really finesse it. You just want to cast something out there, reel it in. A single tail or a twin tail grub in a two, three inch profile, you start getting into four inch. That's a little bit too big in most places, unless you're just specifically targeting trophy fish. Um, this is, this is what you're looking for. Just either one of these on a jig head, cast these out cross current, a little bit upstream, slow to medium, steady retrieve in. You can fish it across the top of the water column, middle of the water column, or, you know, let it fall down to the bottom and then drag it across the stream bed. But it's really hard to go wrong with something like this. Um, I'm partial to my squirm and squirt tubes that I have just about in every single river box, but that's the bait that I found that I'm the most confident in um, that I just catch fish everywhere I go. So that's what I stick to, but I've caught probably the second most fish that I've caught in the state have come on those twin tail and single tail, just root beer, green pepper flake grubs. Um, those are just great for creeks and rivers in this state. Do a good job of mimicking a lot of different prey sources. If you've watched any of these Ask an Angler, you'll hear me say a lot. I like multi-purpose baits. Um, if you fish a swim bait, it's just a swim bait. It's a You're just mimicking a bait fish. When you can fish a tube, a twin tail grub, um, you can mimic so many more things with, with the one bait. So you don't, you don't have to do all the guesswork. You know, if those fish are sitting in the river, which it typically doesn't really come into play. Um, I can throw a grub. I can throw a twin tail grub. I can throw my tube. I can throw a little swim bait. I'm going to find success in all of these clear water creeks pretty easily. Um, so it, that's not as big of an issue, but if for some reason the fish were like, we're just eating crawfish, like we're just keyed in there's, you know, it's crawfish spawning or something. Um, or we're just eating stone flies that are coming down, or we're just targeting grasshoppers or anything, you know, that tube is going to mimic all of that. Um, the little twin tail grubs, you're getting multi-purpose. Uh, but when you're just fishing a swim bait to start and they're not hitting that swim bait, doesn't mean you necessarily have the wrong idea um, going on. It's just, if they're not keying in on just bait fish, they're letting it pass more often than not. So using baits that are multi you know, multi mimicky, uh, they can be seen as a lot of different things. You're going to get more value out of those types of baits. Um, there's not really much in this box. This is just kind of some basic like 
flukes and swim baits, but still pretty basic colors here. Um, you know, a little mini fluke might not be bad, something like this. If you put that on like a little one-aught offset hook and do what we did with the bigger fluke, you could do the same thing with this in like a barren fork and throw it across or uh, Rock Creek, Glover, if you wanted to get size down a little bit um, and try to find like a 14, 15 inch fish, this, that wouldn't be a bad route to go. Now you can always throw these on a jig head and just, you know, just basic like a swim bait and just work it in. Um, but I've found that to really get those bigger aggressive fish to come up into the film, just a basic pearl white weightless and weedless and let it just whip across the top of the current and you'll find success with that. Um, so these are just tubes, all pretty much the same, same color schemes in here. These are the biggest version of the uh, Bass Pro. So this is the Bass Pro Tournament squirt. These are the two and a quarter inch, the Magnum squirt, and then these are the tournament series. So this is like a three inch tube. So you put like an eighth ounce in that and bang that down along the bottom. Illinois, that's not a bad option. You can catch some bigger fish with the bigger tube. Um, and then if you're in a lake, you know, if you're at the North end of 10 killer, if you're in sky took Latonka Arbuckle, you can't beat a tube, you know, something like this working Rocky outcroppings, just letting it fall down to the bottom and bounce it up or slowly just kind of pop your rod tip and let it tweak through the water. Um, that's tubes have gone out of style, but there was a time when tubes were like the rage. That was the only way you go smallmouth fishing was with tubes. And since then drop shotting and, all these scented and baits, but back in the day, it was just the tube. And I'm, I'm definitely, I stick with the tube. That's, that's my go-to bait for, uh, for bass. More river, river bugs and mud bugs and crawfish patterns in here. Still again, same basic color patterns here. Um, so Every brand is going to make, you know, a bug that's a little bit different. So this one is kind of a long slender body, but it's also got little tiny pincers on it. So something like this versus something like this with the big pincers on it. You might get bit more often on this because those fish see this going through the water and they see these big old pincers on it versus this. They might be more apt to take a swing at the smaller ones than they are the bigger ones because they know that those can get them. So a really big fish isn't going to pay much attention to that. But if you're catching just your standard 10, 12 inch, 14 inch smallmouth, they might favor if you're using a crawfish, the smaller size pincers on them. So something to think about, but these are, these are pretty much our colors. We got our watermelon. This one's more of like a bluegill color where we have that, uh, iridescent green and purple for it like a bluegill but all bases of dark greens blacks with red and black flake or just black flake through them that's that is all that you were looking for and all these boxes you'll notice so these are all just river boxes so every single one of them i have some type of you know jig head offset hook bullet weight just so i can i can multi-purpose these baits if i need to when i'm pulling a box out um, so that is my, my one recommendation for river fishing is once you start to find those baits that you're really confident in, that you really like, that you had success for, if you can get to the point where when you go to a creek or river, now when I go float the Illinois, I'll take probably four or five of these boxes with me on my kayak, um, just so I have some different options. But if I'm going to Rock Creek, Blue River, barren fork where I just, I know exactly where I'm fishing, how I'm fishing. When you can get it nailed down to where it just goes into a box that fits into something that's easy, it's going to make your wet wading experience so much better because what you don't want to do is be walking through the river, carrying two rods, a big backpack on, you're up to your waist, then you're trying to retie on, you're moving stuff around, you got to walk back to the bank. When you can get it to the point where you just have your clippers hanging around your neck and a little chest pocket full of whatever different hooks, weights, and uh, soft plastics you're using in a creek, it's going to just improve your experience so much because you're going to get to the point where it's like, I'm nailing fish. All right, I got to change my bait out. 
pop it out, you know, you're tying it right on, you clip it off right back into your pocket. You never had to do anything. But when you're going back and forth between the bank and maybe you're not getting bit that day, it's just those are the little things to help have a better experience while you're out there. The more stuff you bring with you, odds are you're not going to use all of it in the day anyways. So unless you really have a game plan in your head of in this situation, I might want to use this bigger bait in this hole. Um that's why now when I go to places I've never been before, I take this with me first because I know I will catch fish and I'll take mental inventory for the next time that I go of like, there was a couple of runs or there's this hole. I'm going to throw a couple of these into that box the next time I go. Cause I need to get a little bit deeper down into the water column. I want to fish this way. Um, but very rarely, you know, if ever, do you need four five, six boxes of lures on the same trip, especially when you're river fishing. Um, you're just not going to run into that many scenarios in one day of fishing. Um, so this is, this is my, uh, oh, I forgot one, got pinched off in here. Um, all right. This is other than this box right here. This is my other river box that I take everywhere with me. So these are the baits that I have the most confidence in catching the most amount of fishing. So got a couple of different stick worms right here. These are real small. These are Z-Man finesse TRDs. So they're only about two and a half, three inches long. Um, California craw is kind of their green pumpkin, red and black flake. It's got a lighter underbelly with all that red and black. And then the back is more of a black with just the red through it. Really like that color. Um, but it's hard to go wrong with just a basic green pumpkin, black flake. You're never going to go wrong with green pumpkin as your base in any clear water creek. Um, some of their little kind of full body tubes with the little appendages on the back. They're very detailed, realistic. Uh, that one's got a club claw on him. Crawdad. But all of their... All the Z-Man baits, their proprietary blend, I can pull those arms all the way down and they don't compromise them at all. So you can get bit on these all day long and they pair great with all of their little net heads that they make. So I've got an assortment all the way from their smallest one that they make. These are going to be really the two sizes that I'm going to be using is the one tenth ounce and the one fifteenth ounce. So I'm going to stick pretty solid with just these most of the time. But if I do find a bigger hole where I want to get something and I really need to hold the bottom and I just can't do it with the 16th ounce, um, then they have their one sixth, one fifth ounce. So this is a one fifth and a one or one sixth and a one fifth ounce. So these will hold me down on the bottom. You don't need any more weight than that. If you're having to use a half ounce to get down to the bottom, um, then you're probably not in a real small mouthy area anyways. Uh, to be getting down. They also have, I showed one of these earlier, but their little skirted jig with the net head on it. And then pairing this with either a stick worm where it's like that. So it's kind of like the, uh, the bladed jig I showed earlier, something like that, that can be real deadly um, in the Illinois. But again, I encourage people, you know, if you really, do you really have a hankering to do some river fishing in and around this part of the country? Um, you know, give me a shout because there's lots of places outside of our state that you might not be aware of that are pretty close in Arkansas and Missouri that have good public access that have some bigger fish in them. Um, so really the Ozark region, North central Arkansas, South Southern Missouri, and then far Eastern Oklahoma. That's really kind of our part of our really good stream smallmouth fishing and then you got to go to the other side of the mississippi river into eastern tennessee western north carolina to get into the tennessee river system where there's again really good river smallmouth fishing unless you're willing to go up to like the headwaters of uh the mississippi and like brainerd minnesota um and get after smallmouth on the mississippi so we're fortunate that we're in a cool part of the country where we really do have some exceptional clear water um you know wet wading opportunities a lot of the smallmouth fishing on the eastern half of the United States is bigger water. So they're in drift boats and in rafts and 
it's not as easy to wet weight here. You can, you can go into Missouri, Arkansas, Eastern Oklahoma, and you can wet weight it. So you don't need anything. You just pull your car up and just go walk up and down the river as far as you can go and you can catch a ton of fish. So that's pretty cool when you, when you have the ability to be able to do that, you don't need to have floating access to have success. The only place where it's kind of a necessity, it's not really, but to get the most value out of your trip, being able to float the Illinois just so you can hit all the water. But there are tons of public access. So you can go fish around a public access area for an hour, get back in your vehicle, drive down to the next one and and do that as opposed to floating. But I do recommend you try to float the Illinois if you get the chance, especially in middle of October, um, early May, especially just for fishing. Um, but if you happen to go in the summertime for a for a fun recreational float trip, you know, bring a rod with you. Uh, you can't go wrong uh, with a rod on that river. Uh, I got one, two more boxes. So brush hogs, little baby brush hogs. You could use any of these just like those, the crawdads and the little river bugs, anything with appendages on it that's going to get a fish's attention. You could even use a lizard if you wanted to. Um, but when you are going to be using the appendagey baits, the twin tail grubs, uh, the crawfish, the river bugs, anything that is making, you know, just a ton of appendages, those ones you're really trying to fish along the bottom. Um, you want to drag the stream bed. You want to let them fall down, slowly jig them up, let that current hit them, let all those appendages flare and then it falls back down and comes back up and then falls back down um your single tail grubs your tubes uh and your swim baits you can retrieve back to you but any of the appendage baits you're going to get the most value and the bigger bites out of keeping them down on the bottom of the stream bed because what they are mimicking are baits that would be in lower in the water column that crawfish isn't swimming up 20 you know 10 feet up to the surface from the bottom of that pool. Uh, he's only going to come up a couple of feet as he's scurrying away. So trying to keep, and even, you know, bait fish too. That's where you want to get up on the top of the water column. That's where those flukes come in handy to just float them along because then those fish key in, they see that, that bait fish up on top and they're willing to come up and get it. You throw that twin tail grub up on the top. You might get one to come up, um, but you start using like a brush hog or the crawfish or anything like that and start ripping them, higher up in the water column you'll get bit occasionally fish are reactionary you're always going to have a fish that's willing to come give a take but by and large cleaning a hole out or cleaning a run out with casts you're going to get more value out of those appendage baits by keeping them lower in the water column um another one that's pretty popular with uh smallmouth bass and river fishing is just your stick worms different sizes different brands so these uh this is just like a generic bass pro so this is one of those pretty small, it's kind of like the finesse TRD. It might be about a half inch bigger than it, but you can wacky rig these. So you would just throw that out there and you take a little small, like octopus hook or drop shot hook. Uh, just take something like this and you would just go right through the center of this guy like that. And then you'd probably just put like a piece of split shot, like six inches up on your line and cast that straight out cross current, a little bit upstream and just let it fall into the seam and just slowly lift your rod tip, pick up your slack, slowly lift your rod tip. And that's just going to pulse through the water. Um, so a couple different sizes of those, but you really don't need to be getting into like the, the big stick worms, the big like Yamamoto five inch sticking in the three four inch two inch range so here's just a few different few different colors and sizes that we got here but all pretty much basic color scheme again darker backs green pumpkin or watermelon depending on what the brand is how they package it but something like that and that pretty much covers it as far as baits go so if we got any questions go ahead and pop those in um and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, just what you're looking for when you get on the river. Um, but utilize that smallmouth bass angler guide that's in the chat that you're, that's going to give you a lot of value. It's going to cover all the stuff we just talked about here. Um, and for the particular areas, it's going to go into more details specifically with the Google map links to the actual 
parts of the water where you need to park or go. Um, that's always, that's always the biggest thing. Anytime you're going fishing somewhere new out of state, anywhere, you know, the one thing you want to know is where's the public access? How much public access do I have? Where do I need to park? Um, cause a lot of times just doing a aerial Google view doesn't give you everything that you need. Um, you know, you, it looks so much different when you're on ground level. So you're trying to, oh, I thought it looked like this. And you show up and you're like, this is nothing like what I expected. So take advantage of that small mouth angler guide. Um, it's got a lot of good info in it. Um, but, you know, really the biggest thing with clear water creek fishing in Oklahoma is just clear water. Uh, watch the USGS stream gauges. So Barron Fork has a gauge in Eldon, which is three not quite eh, about three quarters of the way to the confluence from the state line, but it's basically halfway in between. So it's a really good measuring stick for water, for all the public access. You're looking at that water being between hundred and 300 CFS. Um, I fished it in 500, 600 CFS when it's clear. And that's fun because there's more water. You can find some bigger fish, but uh, if you're in the 100 to 300, no questions asked. Water is going to be crystal clear. The Illinois under a thousand, it's going to, it should be clear. Uh, if it's been coming off of a big rain, like right now, and it's already been elevated. I mean, who knows the Illinois, it could be, it could be another month until that, you know, depending on how much more rain we get, how it really clears itself up because when that water gets high and it disperses, there's just so much water. Those fish can go in so many different places. Um, but good CFS for Illinois is somewhere between 600 and 900 CFS. Blue River, trickle, um, there's always going to be a little bit of a, a tint to it. You get into like July, August, and we start seeing um, the water clear up a little bit more. Um, it's typically clearest in the winter because uh, we just – picks up algae. There's, some, there's a lot more vegetative growth in Blue River than all the other streams because – it's waterfall and then it's sitting on top of shoals. There's not a really huge stream gradient. So the water's not really moving that quickly. So it's always going to keep somewhat of a dinge, but for blue river, they have a, a USGS gauge in Connerville, which is just probably 10 miles, maybe upstream of our public property. So that's a good stream gauge to use. Illinois has got one right there in Tahlequah to look at um, rock Creek. That one's really just look at the mesonet. I mean, if we haven't picked up any rain and sulfur, but it's a really small creek. It does have some sediment buildup in it. Uh, it's mostly packed cobble, um, but there is some soft spots where silt has fallen in, where the creek's tried to wind its way around. So there is that to, you know, you get some muddy spots in there. But Rock Creek, if it hasn't rained in three or four days in sulfur, good to go. You can wade that one. Um Glover River, Mountain Fork. Uh, I don't, if the Glover has a stream gauge on it, I'm not sure where it is. I think I've looked and I, I may have found one. Uh, Mountain Fork has one uh, below downstream and upstream of the lake. Uh, but you're just looking on USGS gauges. They're going to have little yellow triangles for every day. And that's basically the mean flow. So if you took every day of recorded for that particular day of the year, over the past hundred years, that's what the, you know, the mean flow has been. So anytime you're right on those triangles, especially in the summertime, you're good to go. That means you're right at normal flow. If you're down below it, you're going to be fine. That's, that's great. You know, these are spring fed bodies of water. Now blue river gets warm. Um, Rock Creek is going to stay cool all summer. Barren Fork stays cool. Illinois stays pretty cool. Um, Glover river stays pretty cool. Uh, mountain fork stays pretty cool. So those bodies of water, even if they're low, if they're below that mean, that's good. That means you have, you can shoot fish in a barrel because they have to go into runs and holes. They can't spread out. Um, if that water is a little bit elevated or at normal pool, if they have more water, if they really have to suck into, um, you know, anywhere where there's faster moving water. That's the thing is you get into the middle of the day, especially at a place like Barren Fork, where the water is so crystal clear and it's so shallow that you're trying to trying to hide yourself a little bit, you know, staying downstream, casting up to fish. 
But what's going to happen is those fish are really going to suck into where that water is moving pretty fast. That's going to be the highest amount of oxygen, that cold oxygenated water that's flowing through. So when you see little runs of water that's moving pretty quickly and it's dumping into a pool, you're going to have fish pushed up right there. Uh, if you have like a log or something, that water's ripping by it, there's going to be fish sitting right up under that log waiting for food that's flushing down. But the farther we get into the summer, July, August, they're going to get out of that shallow, slow moving water in the middle of the day. So from 10 o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night, um, basically as long as the sun is hitting the water, they're going to push into the faster moving water in the summer. Um, then as you know, dusk and dawn, they're going to start to prowl that shallow, slow moving, warmer water for a couple hours um, at dusk and at dawn. Uh, so that's a good time to to look in those areas and then throw some top water uh, or try some different baits for them. Um, but that's that's really what you're looking for. Uh, let's see. I don't if you got any questions now that now's the time to ask. We got about 10 minutes left. Um, Trying to think just what would be, oh, we can do some fly fishing stuff. I forgot about that. Uh, here's again, just some like rage tail. Again, just twin tail deals. I mean, anything that's in a black base, a green base or a brown base with some red and black flake on it that you can put to a jig head, you're going to catch bass. So Fly fishing, if you want to go fly fishing for some smallmouth or just creek bass, that's also pretty fun. Like I said, I throw my, I throw a 164th ounce jig head in the inch and a half tube. Um, that's what I throw on a fly rod. And I'll cast it out, cross current a little bit upstream, and then I just strip it through. Just like I'm swinging a, swinging a minnow or swimming or swinging a woolly bugger jig fly, bead head fly. I fish a tube, so you can you can do a little hybrid fly fishing, but anything, any woolly bugger, size six to size ten, size two to size ten, really. But basic colors, orange, brown, olive, anything like this, and you're gonna cast these uh, straight upstream. 45 degrees cross current let your floating fly line go it's going to do all the work for you um so just let that line bow out and as that uh woolly bugger or your clouser minnow or your jig fly your articulate articulated fly whatever you're throwing um that is that you need to strip just let that line bow out ahead of you and the second that it creates that bow give it a couple of quick strips occasionally just until that fly gets all the way to the end. And then once it gets to the end, give it two quick strips, nothing there. That gives you enough fly line to pick it up. And then, you know, you should be able to just whip it straight back. One cast, put it right back into the strike zone, float it down again. Um, and then you can use, you know, clouds or minnows, anything, just chartreuse, olive, brown. They all have white bases on them. But those are great for stripping flies. Um, have some jig flies. So here's like an articulated jig fly where we've got our back end that's articulated. Got a nice owner hook on this jig head fly. It's pretty heavy. So this dives down, but again, you're just stripping this through the water. So these are becoming more popular now. Chocolates changers are probably the most notable popular ones out there that are articulated jig flies that basically work like a swim bait, but they're a fly, but something like that. Um, and that's, that's how I like to fly fish, you know, really for anything, whether it be trout, small mouth, warm water species. If I'm fishing a river, I really like to swing a fly. I like that horizontal presentation where it's coming and twitching it behind logs and boulders and you get that just hammered hit. Because when that thing's swinging, I mean, usually you just watch the end of your fly line go tearing off. So it's a pretty cool take when they hit it. But just like trout fishing, all of these clear water, smallmouth, sunfish, even sucker fish. So fly fishing, you can really get into some of the cooler fish in the river. Because if you start using like really small nymph flies, 
um, pheasant tails, lightning bugs, bloody marys, copper johns, crackback caddis, anything that's a caddis or mayfly, stonefly imitator, especially if you can get some like uh, like rubber legs on it, like a rubber legged yellow Sally in like a size 14, 16, 18, somewhere in there. You can either throw it out there. I, I don't like to use a strike indicator bobber if I don't have to. Here's a pretty common one for a fly rod. But if you do, you're just going to throw it out there and mend it and let it try to just dead drift down. But any of our like Prince nymphs and uh, stonefly imitators and then our mayfly imitators, uh, Bloody Marys and Copper Johns in here, pheasant tails, those are going to work really well. And you have the chance to get into micro species. So like shiners, darters, small sucker fish, but you can also catch the bigger non-game fish, the, the river red horses and carp suckers and drum and buffalo and carp. Uh, they're, they will take those flies more often than not. It's actually pretty fun. Uh, and you can do the same thing with like a little piece of worm and let it bounce along the bottom. So always, always tons of options when you're on a creek or river. You go out to the big lake, the big reservoir, and Either you're not in the right spot, fish aren't biting that day, there's a weather pattern that's affecting. There's lots of things that can negatively impact success on big bodies of water. Um, when you're in a small pond, small city lake, most of the time there's pretty predictable patterns to be able to dissect where you can catch fish over the course of a day. The thing about creeks and rivers, these fish have to expend energy all day long. So they're always feeding. The only thing that really throws off the bite is discolored water. Um, that could either be because they can't see the lures as well, because it makes them uncomfortable. So they sit down to structure just for whatever reason. If that water gets a little cloudy, you just know that the bite is not going to be very good. You can still catch fish, but it's just not going to be very good. You can also throw dry flies uh, for smallmouth as well as your other river species. Um, again, caddis hatch, mayfly hatch. So you get a lot of small darters and shiner type fish that will actually take really small dries, little mayfly size 18, size 20 mayfly, uh, and then size 12 to 16 caddis hatches. But great time of the year during the summer to throw your big fluffy flies that are really easy to see that float great that you don't have to put any floating on. Um, so your foam body hoppers and ants, things like this. These are great for beginning fly anglers. So if you're just getting into fly fishing or you want to try it for the first time, or maybe you've never tried to dry fly fish for warm water species, great thing about throwing hoppers in terrestrial patterns, even like a bass, uh, like a popper. So there's a little fly popper, something like this. These are great because you can smash these on the water. So when your caddis flies and your may flies, when they're landing on the water to lay their eggs, they come in very gracefully. They sit on the film, very natural, not a lot of movement. Their mate, they, their bodies are built to where they can take off up off the water. So they're not making a lot of distractions, disruptions. When a grasshopper falls in the water, he's not supposed to be in the water. That thing's freaking out. His arms are going everywhere. He's swimming, he's twitching. So it's great because you can take a hopper and you can just smash them on the water. So if you're not a very good caster, you know, don't worry about your drag free drift. Like just get the hopper on the water and let them go. If you can make an upriver mend just to make it easier. So if you let your line go too far, what happens is your bug will be floating along and it looks pretty good. It's pretty drag free and you got a big bow out ahead of you. And all of a sudden that fish comes up to grab it but your line has been caught and you'll watch your fly go shoot. I mean, it'll just take off as the river catches it and you'll see a fish come up and your flies, you know, five feet down the river from the time that it went to surface. So hoppers, stimulators, rubber legged stimulators and hopper flies, tan bodies, just keep it basic. You can go with a red or a black or a green, but tans, olives, light yellow those are going to be the base the body color that you're looking for and then just whatever you know tuft pattern posts that they put on it so uh that's a stone fly like this is this is a good one so this is this could be an ant or a hopper 
but just very basic. It's kind of dark through body, nice white tuft on it. So it's easy to see when it's floating on top of the water for you, the angler, and then a nice bright tan body for the uh, fish to see from below. But you can smack those on the water. You can even twitch them a little bit. Like you're going to get away with a lot more because those fish are looking for a terrestrial bug that is now paralyzed on the water because it's not supposed to be on the water. So uh, that's, that's kind of your route for fly fishing. But uh, the fly, the stripping flies is a ton of fun. Um, that's those are going to be the the fun bite. You're going to be stripping and bam, it's like getting hit by a truck where it just grabs onto the end of that thing. Um, nymphing is going to lead you to more of a diverse array of fish species. It could potentially land you some of the bigger fish in the river that aren't smallmouth that are your non-game species, which is awesome um, to hook up into those. It's always fun to get cool bycatch when you're out fishing um and then your dry patterns so your little mayfly and caddisfly imitators especially in the summertime small mayfly patterns uh you're going to catch lots of different types of fish again could be real small micro species if you're using size 16 size 18 bugs uh and then if you get into your basic size 10 to size 16 hopper stimulator patterns you could catch anything i mean anything that's looking to come up it could be a bass sunfish rock bass warmouth uh you know maybe even a sun a sunfish or a, a little bait fish that just happens to come up and can get the hook so fly fishing is a is a great option during the summertime and it's a good time to practice if you really like trout fishing with a fly rod summertime especially going to barren fork that's a great place to practice because those smallmouth are oriented a lot like trout so if you can start catching smallmouth by stripping flies uh, you're going to be able to start catching trout doing the same thing because you're really you're really just doing the same exact thing. Then you get a much uh, more less delicate topwater presentation than you do with trout, and then you have your your basic bread and butter trout, dry flies with may mayflies and caddis, or you know real small nymph flies, and working them you know drag free drifts like you would for trout. So you kind of get a good combination, but it's great practice. And you can also throw on some real small artificial lures onto your fly rod as well, um, which most people don't think about, but great for, uh, for the warm water. The only other one that I got here that's kind of a specialty novel uh, item of what I've been seeing out on the rivers lately is a ton of gar. Uh, I've seen more gar this year than I, I think I've ever seen. Um, not in places that I don't typically see as many gar as I've seen. So Always good to keep a, a gar lure with you. So I tied this one. This is basically just a barrel swivel with a zip tie and a piece of nylon rope that I threaded out with a wire brush and put a couple of pieces of ripple flash fly material in it to give it a little bit of flash. But it's got no hook on it. So these uh, these are great. And if they're super easy. Like if you want to get in, like if you don't want to, tie flies you're not quite ready to tie flies this is a great intermediary because it's not really anything like tying flies because it's a lot easier but all you need is just a piece of rope you cut the rope and all these little deals you basically you just unwind them all the way down to a singular strand so you would cut cut yourself off a few strands uh, i think i put some in a bag in here yeah so when you cut them, they're going to look something like this. So I did this for my non-game Ask an Angler on Monday. So this one is tied, but it's roped out. So what you do, you can do it both ways. You can tie it already and you put it on there and you run it through, leave yourself a little bit of tag end to begin with, and then you just cinch it tight with a zip tie below the barrel and then cut off the excess tag. And then all you do is you take your wire brush, something like this, just a basic wire brush. And you're just going to put this down on a hard surface, like on a plastic table, something you don't mind scratching up with a wire brush and you just lay it down and you just hold on to it and pull your wire brush and then pull this on the other end. And you just keep fraying it out until you get to this. It's great. It's easy to, to do. And all you need is, you know, you can cut up all the materials and just take the wire brush, 
So I usually always have this bag in my truck with the wire brush just in case you find gar because gar are a ton of fun at any size to catch on rod and reel. Um, and they make your lure better the more you catch because as they get in there, they get stuck. They can't get their teeth out of it. That's why you don't need a hook. So when you get them in, if you didn't, like this one is pretty good. Uh, most of the time I don't feather them out quite this nicely. So usually once you get those first couple of fish, they've done the work of the wire brush for you. They'll fray it out. So, but what you do need, if you're going to go gar fishing, always have at least one pair, like, or one hand of a glove. So when you're holding them and you got to go get their mouth open with pliers to pull the, you know, you just, you basically just get the pliers and just grab it right below the swivel and the zip tie and just rip it out and it'll, it'll fray and all that. And that's good. It helps the lure, but what you don't want with the gar is for them to slide backwards in your hand. They have rear base, rear facing scales that come to a point like an arrowhead. They will hurt you. They will cut. I mean, they'll cheese grater your hand. So one thing to pay attention to with gar, I, if you want to hold them, you know, with your shirt sleeve or you want to take the risk of holding on to them and hope they don't move on you, that's fine. But just understand that they can hurt you. So it's always good if you're going to actively target gar, just keep one, you know, beat down garden glove or fishing glove or just something that's got a rubber or leather base where you can hold on to that fish where they're not going to slice your hands open afterwards. But that brings us to the end here. If anybody's got any questions, go ahead and throw them in there. Otherwise, uh, go ahead and get signed off. Appreciate everybody coming. Um, it's a great time of year to get out there. Water levels, a little high right now. We just picked up some rain. Looks like we're going to get some more rain next week. So you can maybe try a Rock Creek or a Blue River right now. Blue River is going to be a little stained. It was still a little high. Illinois, I think, is out of the question right now. Barren Fork was coming back down. It will probably be good this weekend. Um, by tomorrow, it should be back to normal flow. So if you live over in the eastern half of the state, this would be a good weekend to go give Barren Fork a shot on Sunday or Monday. Give it that extra day to dry out a little bit more. Um, Illinois usually... Just it gets so disrupted in middle of May to through June, just with the rain that you get in that part. And Illinois picks up so much water from so many different tributaries that that you got to hit it in the first couple of weeks of May before we really start to get into the rainy season. And then once you get to July, usually then it it'll stabilize in a couple of days, and then it just is like that for the rest of the summer. Um, another good stretch on the Illinois is the place where the commercial outfitters don't go, you know, around, around the big bend or even South of highway 62, you get some bigger water through there. You can find some bigger fish, but I've found that the most productive stretch, just overall number of fish quality mixed with quantity is round hollow to pea vine, but you can also do, you know, pea vine down to Edmondson. You could do Edmondson down to, like no head or a choda or float all the way down to 62, just completely up to you on how fast you want to float what you're doing, but got tons of wet waiting opportunities at every single one of those public access sites. Uh, but a choda, choda is a good one and no head for if you want to go wet wade, because you can wander down the river and that's typically out of the way of where the float traffic comes from. So if you want to wet wade with no float traffic, those are the two good public access ones to go to where you won't have to deal with them as much in the summer. But um, if you're out there in the summertime, you know, midweek, if you can swing it like a Wednesday or usually a Wednesday, you know, two days, two days to calm down from the weekend and two days, you know, Thursday float traffic starts to pick up again. And then by Friday, it's usually pretty busy, but you can catch fish out there. Um, I've done it when it's been total, total chaos of, bumper rafts out there and still catching 30, 40 fish and, you know, four or five hours of floating down the river. So the pretty good catch rates, you get to Barren Fork, you're looking at 40, 50, 60, 70 fish, um, in a day of wet wading up and down. But again, most of them. So make your tackle to suit it. You take a light action rod with four pound test or six pound test to Barren Fork and you won't care that they're six inches or eight inches or 10 inches. Those fish are going to be turning your rod over all day long, 
driving up and down the river. So if you tailor your equipment to make it more of a fair match with the fish, you're going to have plenty of fun. If you go to Baron Fork with a heavy action rod, 12 pound test, I mean, you're just, you're going to be ripping them out of the water. So, uh, I mean, the only, only thing else I can leave with is, uh, anytime you're wet wading, pack it in, pack it out and try to keep these streams as pristine as we can. Um, if you can pick up public areas, you know, if you have maybe the bed of your truck, if there's some garbage laying around, throw it in the back of your truck. If you don't mind handle fish with care, wet your hands before you touch them. So when you're wet wading, you don't have any excuses. You're already wet. You're reeling fishing, dip whatever hand you plan on holding the fish in the water so that you don't rip the slime off of their backs, which then leads to bacterial infections, which can ultimately result in mortality. So all you're doing is just scooping up the fish and then, you know, get get it uh, the hook out as quickly as possible. As we get later into the summer, try to play the fish a little bit quicker. You know, if you can control the fish, don't just let it run up and down for five minutes on the hook because it'll exhaust itself so try to get them in quick when you can release them as fast as you can try to keep them in the water the whole time if you're going to take your picture you know maybe try to do it down while the fish is still in the water or you just hold it up quickly and put it back in the water um barbless hooks I, i'll debarb most of my especially at barren fort i'll pinch the barbs on all my tubes just so the fish have a chance um, and I don't have to worry about as big of a mortality rate. You're on the Illinois, your average size fish is more like 12 to 14 inches, 10 to 14 inches. So it's a bigger fish. Um, so, and it's faster moving water. So you kind of need the barb to hold on to them, but you know, fair sporting, if you want to clip it for more of a challenge. Um, but yeah, those Barren Fork Creek, uh, fish, especially take, handle them with care. You know, they, most of them are pretty small. So, you know, barbless hooks flies quick handling get your hands wet so that's all i got it's about 10 after so appreciate you all being here got my contact information reach out to me i love stream fishing so odds are if you're out there on a saturday or sunday this summer on any one of these places you're bound to run into me at some point um but holler at me if you have any questions if you need places to go what to buy what you need anything i i I'm a, I'm a wealth of knowledge when it comes to, to river fishing and especially clear water streams here in Oklahoma. So try to get you out there. Uh, it's a great time to take somebody new fishing. Dog days of summer, July, August, turn a camping trip into a clear water wading trip, um, especially Barren Fork. It's so easy. Like our Bamberger property, especially, you get right on the water. You can go upstream, downstream, nice big gravel bars. Like it is the perfect place to take. When we take uh, my daughter out there, she's she was two and a half last summer and she was wet wading up and down the stream. So great place for dogs, kids, whole family, set up lawn chairs. You can fish right there out of the parking area. There's a pretty good run where fish get stacked up and they're pretty good. So um, just uh, get out there and, and enjoy it. And until next time, uh, I don't, we don't have any more asking anglers coming up probably until the fall. So best of luck out there this summer. And uh, we will see you on the flip side. Tight lines. Be safe. Enjoy the summer.